And Sato's Place is brought to you by... We've got a fellow Canadian in the house, brand new ITLs, lots of information for you. You're at the place, it's Pensado's Place. Hey guys, everybody welcome. <laughs> I'm still in a giddy mood, I don't know why, it's been a weird week. Man, hey guys, thank you so much for being here. This is going to be a great show. We've got a cat tonight uh, that's going to be inspiring on so many levels because he does so many things so well and represents, I think, perfectly uh, the engineer of today oh, cool. and producer. And he lives in Montreal. So, uh, you know, in honor of. Absolutely. That's pretty cool. So why don't we, uh, should we get to stuff so Let's we can get it. to our guests? I know you got a lot to do. This we week. have a lot to do. So, uh, hey everybody, we're coming to you from the Art Institute of California in Los Angeles, like we usually do, our beautiful HD facility, which we're happy to be in. Contact us at uh, Facebook and Twitter and our YouTube channel. We'll get back to you. We always enjoy your commentary. Uh, let's say hello to our Vintage King family. Hey, Vintage King guys. <laughs> Uh, I'm way, still reeling way. from several weeks ago when we from were over there. A couple weeks ago, we went to their party, had a good time. Um, they've done some cool stuff. They got a new Vintage King website. Um, you can do some interesting stuff on it. User reviews. There's new content on the blog all the time. Uh, it's a faster website. You can create wish lists. You can order easier, and you can also catch our latest episode on their website, which do is we a get very cool thing. For it? Yeah, we do get okay. credit for it. They they love us, and we love them. Um, same thing with our avid friends. Uh, as a matter of fact, when, oh. we, when you guys went up to the Palm several weeks ago, uh, Anthony Gordon at Avid, one of our buddies, was mm -hmm. instrumental in, did oh, he help oh, us with oh, our he, guests? He, yeah, he, no, he did. He sent an email to, uh, to Damien and hooked it all up. So oh, thanks, cool, Anthony. cool. So Anthony Appreciate and Avid, it. thank you for that, as usual. Um, uh, as of this week, uh, our, in our Indaba Mix contest, our submission period closed. The voting ends October 17th. That's going to be very cool. So uh, it's been great working with Billy Martin and uh, and that song Muffaletta and the Indaba team. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Uh, the group's Wicked Knee. It's so going cool. To be I wish I had that opportunity when I started. I just I was dying I to know. get on my first record. And, and we're going to do some more of that stuff. It's, it's a bunch of good Allow stuff. Allow me to get on my first record? Uh, yeah, exactly right. Uh, and the last thing, um, you heard us last week talk about this. Um, go to uh, pensadosplace.tv forward slash education. We're garnering all the educational stuff and uh, programs and colleges and universities that watch the show for lots of good reasons that will come back to you. You'll see what you should submit there. There's three or four easy questions. Please check that out and let us know that you're out there so we can compile all that. That's important stuff. Um, can I say real, something real quick? Yeah, absolutely, when, man. When, when you and I were first discussing the show and essentially you were coming up with how the show was gonna work and everything, we both agreed at that point in time about the importance and necessity for this show to have a, a very centered educational component to yep. it. So, so there's not a random, randomness to this. This is a very important yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's thanks to you that, that we're able to do this. So we want to try to gather all that information. Mm -hmm. So we really want to know the programs and schools. So anyways, you can, go, you, can go, you can go see that. But again, pensadosplace.tv forward slash education. We got a great guest, great stuff. Why don't you throw the ITL and so we can get to it. Well, we're moving along today. Uh, I, I think you're going to get a kick out of this one. Uh, I, I think I set it up when we first did it, so run it well when you get a chance. Oh, hey guys, just saying goodbye to my THC EQ from Kush Audio with a K. Uh, Greg Scott over there makes some incredible stuff. I got to send this back to him. I don't think I will. I think I'm going to keep it. This thing is incredible. Check out Vintage King. I'm sure they have them. Today what I thought I'd do is, I've been mixing a group called D Mechanic. You'll hear about them soon. Really, really, really good stuff. And there were a couple of songs, and I, as I was mixing them, I started thinking, God, this would make a great example of some of the things I've shown you guys before. S sounds change, things change. When you hear a song from the 80s, you immediately know it's a song from the 80s. So we have to assume that things we're doing now are going to sound like the 2012s, 10 years from now. But one of the things we're doing is we're adding a little more mid-range to the vocals so that they can compete with the increased uh, amount of limiting we do on the stereo bus. If everything's squashed, uh, EQ is a way to get things to stand out more. If you can't use dynamics, you can use EQ. So I thought this vocal had a lot of interesting examples of how to approach that. So let's jump right in. Let me play you the song. 
This is Into Her Eyes by D Mechanic. Six steps in the min. This dance was calling me in. My interior being's going crazy. Let me play you the raw vocal before I touched it. This is what it sounded like when I got it. Six steps in the min. This dance was calling me in. My interior being's going crazy. You can see it has a little trouble competing with all the mid-range stuff I've got in the track. So now let me solo this and show you what I got. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. Now, what I did was I used a new EQ for me. It's not new, but it's new to me. I like this EQ because it sounds good and then I can, I can solo various frequencies. So let's, let me put it in for you. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This now, I wanted a little more of this frequency. If I click this, I can solo just the frequency, 15K. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This dance was calling me in. Okay, now what you'll notice, I've rolled off a lot of the low end. I've added some 15K. Add a little bit above that. I'm, I'm getting it ready to compete once it's limited in mastering, and then I'm, I'm creating a sound that's unique for this song. Now watch what happens. As I add elements back, we're gonna get a little bit of the bottom back. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This dance was calling me in, my interior. Okay, now with the, with the UA, UAD 1176, you see, I got a little bit of the roundness back. I also got a little bit of volume, cheating. Now, here's the um, Shadow Hills compressor, the Pensado edition. This, this adds even more uh, fullness to the bottom. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. Ow. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. Yeah. Okay, now all this de is doing is just a shelf type DSing, which I like better on the on the uh, Waves version than I did on the Massey that I normally use. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This dance was... Sounds real musical. Okay, so let's check out some of the effects that I added. Now, I wouldn't call it an effect, but it's parallel compressing. I wanted to add a little bit of the bottom back in, so I'm, I'm doing it via squeezing a little bit, nothing, nothing unusual, just a standard compressor, feeding that back in, let me show you that. Okay, I'm gonna add a little bit of the return. I can't do it from the sin because it'll squeeze it, so. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This dance was calling me in, my interior being. Okay, so you see it just adds a little bit of the compressed original back in, which gives us, gives us a little more of that roundness. Now, another thing, if you remember, Tom Elmhurst and Justin Niebank, talk, Niebank talked about, and, and um, uh, Andrew Shep talked about mono spring reverbs. So I'm adding a little mono spring reverb. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. And I'm also got a delay on that reverb. And then uh, this, this is one of my favorites. This is um, our old standby. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna break that down for you so you can see. All it really is is, is just a doubler. I'm detuning and tuning, minus one plus one, staying within the uh, Haas effect, 19 milliseconds. 14 on the other side. The numbers aren't as important as just that they're different in past 14. And then uh, that's dumping into just a, a little touch of 7K and then a waves imager to kind of widen it. And then last but not least, I'm adding a little piece of outboard gear. This is the Eventide Orville. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. This the, there's pieces of gear that, that 
that over time you just get a comfort factor with. You've, you've used them so much, you know what they sound like, they're predictable. You don't want to use too many of those, but every once in a while it's just the perfect piece of gear. And this song was just screaming for a preset on, on, uh, on the Orville. Not a lot of you guys have that, but basically it's another uh, plus and minus pitch thing, harmonizer, uh, an average reverb and uh, an eighth note delay, but the combination just so perfect in that preset. And, uh, but you can create that uh, kind of like what we did already, but we're doubling up a couple of things here. Okay, once again, here's the finished product. Six steps in the min, this dance was calling me in, my interior being's going crazy. I saw her eye going in the middle of a dark. So okay. So remember now, we're, we're looking for a, a, a sound that matches the song. We're looking for a sound that matches the world we live in. We're looking for a sound that's gonna compete and withstand the pressures of uh, a little extra limiting. And I think we found it. Herb, you're gonna have to help me. Okay. If, I, if I introduce Damien Taylor and just describe his accomplishments, we're going to do a double episode before I even get to talk to the man. <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, edit me and help me get, get into this quicker. Damien, first of all, man, I know you had Welcome to go through me. some problems Thank to get here. And we really appreciate the it's flight, pleasure, the flying, and the, yeah. Hello. the late notice. And it wouldn't be fun if there wasn't an airplane involved. That's I think. right. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, guys, Damien comes to us from via Montreal, via New Zealand, via... Lots of stuff. England. Lots of places. Yeah. And... and um, Man, one of the things that, let's just jump right in. One of the things that, that, that struck me when I was, uh, I was familiar with, with your work with the Killers, and of course, everyone knows you from Bjork because you were with her for 11 years. I mean, off and on, but yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, two albums, several tours. Uh huh. Did you, you did, well, you did the I, last two albums, the ones I'm familiar with. I did with. the last two albums start to finish, and I worked with her on the early stages of Vespertine with the producer Guy Sigsworth, who has engineering for. Ah. So that's when we first met and got on really well. And then it was like about six years later that she needed someone to come in full time, and we'd kind of kept in touch. Right. So, oh, yeah. Perfect. And, and Guy's, a, Guy's a legend. He's, he's so talented. Guy's amazing. Amazing. He uh, is I ridiculous. I think Americans aren't quite familiar with him, but yeah. he's one of those little hidden gems tucked away in yeah. England. Yeah, you know? it's, it's funny because I worked with him right at the start of my career. Or while well, this started my freelance career, and I look back on it now and go, I was just so blessed, so blessed to, have to work with him. It was, it was he was kind of like my university, because ah. um, he 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 like read music at Cambridge and went to the Harpsichord Academy mm. in, in Amsterdam and all that. But he could apply like a, a kind of a British intellectual mindset to the street music of London at the time. So we'd drive around nice. in this little mini and we'd be like scanning through listening to pirate radio and go like, oh yes, Speed Garage, it's, a, it's, a, it's got this lovely triplet swing and see they're pitching up all their snare drums. It's really, and then he'd go into the studio and make this totally badass stuff, but he had perfect pitch and really? could, yeah, it's, he was insane. And then anytime we had dinner, he'd basically give me a lecture on arrangement oh or on God. programming or oh, on the, so, cool. so yeah how incredible was that experience? it was uh, yeah the, the the longer it's been since i worked with him the more i look back at that and go like oh my god yeah. <laughs> you know? Unbelievable. So. i'm gonna assume that you're gonna come back for a future show with us <laughs> and at that show you'll be known for the great work you did on the new killers record but at this point in time mm -hmm. you're known for the reactable is that am yeah, i saying it correct think, the reactable yeah yeah <laughs> That's the most amazing. I know you're tired of talking about it because I, I, I know it. you use yeah. it every day for years on yeah. tour with Bjork. But let's start there. Are you comfortable with that? I'm, I'd, I'd love to talk about the This thing yeah, is like, ahead. is it as cool as it looks to operate? It's more. It's more. Like, um, I, we, we were working with Spike to mix Bjork's Volta album. Mm -hmm. And uh, not to be a name dropping bastard, but like Michelle Gondry <laughs> sent her like a YouTube link, mm -hmm. which was the very first demonstrations that mm -hmm. they put online. Right. And, uh, and this is before she'd asked me to be involved on the tour and we were watching it and I was just like, I honestly thought it was like a computer animation. Like I, you, I, I couldn't know. comprehend that it actually existed. You know, the, I thought it was like a practical back, joke. Backtrack a little bit, Damien, yeah. because a couple of people are gonna run look it up. And, yeah. and, but they for the people definitely. that are too lazy to do that, <laughs> give them like the 30 second overview okay. of what this damn thing well, does. Is it as big as this table? It's, uh, the one I played was like a meter round. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically it's like if you imagine the kind of components in a modular synthesizer or guitar effects units with uh, the circular tabletop interface and instead of plugging cables you have these little blocks that you put on the table and they're it, freestanding, Herb. They're yeah. Like, it's, really? like, it's like this, right? Yeah, it's, it's just it, like... And, and you twist them? Exactly, yeah. Oh, and, my God. And, and, and when, you, when they touch the table... The, I, it I'm, lights up, yeah, it draws a waveform in real time, so you can see what's happening as well as hear it. 
Wow. But um, I mean, it was funny, like well, after Bjork asked me to be involved with the tour, uh, we, we actually flew from Mastering in New York to have a meeting with the, the team who made it in Paris. They're from wow. Barcelona, but they met us in Paris because I think she had some promo there. And we're trying to figure out like, oh, can we use this? And you know, we did the meeting with them and had to play around. We we're like, yeah, this is pretty cool. Like, we'll take one. And then they're like, oh, uh, well, we'll have to build you one because there isn't another one. So we were like the first people outside of the creators to get one. When you, when you use it at Coachella, did yeah. you have, uh, by the way, everybody was talking about that performance at Coachella. <laughs> that you had cameras on top of it yeah. so, the, so the audience could actually see that you were really Exactly, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's like full credit to Björk because she just saw it and she loved the fact that it could visually demonstrate electronic yeah. music and she wanted her audience to understand that dudes sitting there with the computers are actually doing something. Right. So we had, we had the React one, we also had the Lemur touchscreen, which I'm, I'm a huge fan of. So, yeah, so she had video guys with kind of cameras everywhere. That's the but, one you have in the picture of you everywhere. Uh, that one's the, the Tenorion, oh. uh, which is a different thing. The, the lemur is like a, it's a kind of touch screen interface and you can design your own interfaces or, or design oh, yeah. your own layouts, which on her tour we had 42 songs in the repertoire and she would write a new set list every night. So if you've got your MIDI controller and you're using a generic one, and you're trying to remember on the 23rd song, what does the fifth gray knob from the left do? Right. Like, you're just up the creek. Right. So the lemur was amazing, because you could say, you figure out what you want to control on a song, then you make an interface with just that, just those controls on it laid out the way you want. And so for me as well, coming that was after I'd been in studios full time about 10 years maybe, mm -hmm. and to use like the lemur and the reactable that were such like different interfaces or, or the way that you physically interact with them was completely different it kind of really took me into a whole different place oh God, um, you know yeah. yeah just just like on, on the kind of intuitive level of stuff and I mean I also had like a 32 channel mixing desk with feeds from everyone in the band coming back to me so that I could send them through my laptop or through effects and a chaos pad and a couple of synths but it was funny like once I kind of like settled into the tour it was kind of the 10 years of being a studio nerd really paid off. It was almost like that was a version of playing your scales because without even thinking about it, you just kind of like grab this horn section, bust into the chaos pad, send that over there, bring that back up there, and then you're kind of like sending it off to your H3000. It's, 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 it's incredible. It was a lot of fun. I, yeah. I want to go just sit on the side <laughs> of the stage and watch it work. That's and amazing. Then, and, then, and then you factor in Bjork, who's like, yeah. Like she's just on another level. Yeah. I got, you know actually, this is, I think, like, you know, we mentioned before we started, like, you know, what is the philosophy of what we do? Yeah. And being in her band is a really funny thing because it, it kind of sums up what we do. It's like I'd come off stage sometimes and be like, oh man, I just played an amazing gig. Um, but without her singing on it, it's it like, who gives a yeah. shit? Yeah, you know what I mean? Right. And it's like, and sometimes, you know, I'd, I'd come off stage feeling I'd felt terrible and someone would come and be like, oh, it was amazing. I cried. Right, and, you right, know, all right, that right. kind right. of I'm stuff. A, I'm a, I'm a, as Herb can tell you, I specialize in just changing subjects for yeah, no reason. Yeah, let's go there. <laughs> so, you mentioned her vocals. Mm -hmm. the, the last two records of hers, you, you were very, very involved with those. Yeah. How difficult, from an engineering perspective and a production perspective, is it to, to take her vocal? Because before her vocal gets on these things, they're the most unique, cool, weird, unmusical collections of noises and sounds that yeah, you just yeah. are drawn to like 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 watching a car wreck yeah and then her vocal you I can't imagine it when I hear it completed it's like oh that's it's perfect yeah. but it doesn't there's there's I mean I think probably the best compliment I could ever pay her is I've always had like unwavering faith in her artistic instinct mm -hmm. and she very much leads a process like she's her own producer so I would just help her do whatever she needed to do and some days that was like making her a cup of tea and let her think about something you know sure. so but really um yeah there's been a number of times and I've just been like what the hell <laughs> are we working on and then you know she'll put in one sound or or just sing one thing on it and off you go yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, she's, she was, it, it's really interesting. She hates being in a separate vocal booth. She doesn't like wearing headphones. So we'd always be recording in the same room. Mm. And I kind of, cause I got to know her so well, I could kind of just, compression really works really badly when you're recording her. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you wait, could wait, almost wait, like- Expand on that. Well, um, she's, she got, she's got a huge dynamic range, yeah. And you don't want her big notes to suddenly squash up and be tiny. I yeah. mean, uh, I'm, I'm disappointed to say there's a couple of moments on every album where she caught me out. <laughs> you know, and there's like, oh, man. But, um, but yeah, so I'd just like be writing input gains the whole time. And, and you could kind of feel like where she's going with the song. And sure. like if she's taking a breath, you could kind of feel that coming and well, lean back a bit, you know. I mean, she, um, she, does she do more than one take? So 
you had a chance Sometime, to learn them? Yeah, or, well, or is it all in the she's moment? really, really, really into capturing the first performance of a song. Oh, okay. um, so, but she'll do a number of takes, and then she likes comp stuff herself. So she'll sit down and you know make all her notes and mm -hmm. sit down on Pro Tools and do stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but it's really like you have to be ready to capture anything anytime. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's almost interesting working with her because things would almost go in these really long, kind of almost like two week cycles, where. Uh, just, you know, to back up, like I'd worked with her on the last two records from the start of her writing them. So you'd have long periods where, like, as an engineer, you're not really doing much, but then there'd suddenly be one day where it all kicks off and she's just, like, totally in the moment. She'd kind of tell you in the morning, like, I want to sing today, and she'd go and do her warm-ups, so then you get everything ready and make sure everything's ready to go. Does she compose the songs? I mean, I'm not saying get a sheet mm -hmm. of staff paper and yeah. write the notes, but does she come in with an idea or do, the, or do, well, do, do they kind of organically grow from a nucleus and a little seed? Any way you could imagine of putting a song together, she, she does. She actually does sit down with Sibelius and write out notes on a musical score on some does. songs, yeah. Then other songs were like completely kind of improvised and then edited and other songs are like someone would send her a backing track and she put a vocal like on it. It seems like process, particularly with an artist of her caliber and she would obviously need to trust whoever she's working with because it feels like so much of it is intuitive somehow. Yeah, yeah. There's a connection that you have to have in order for that well, part to come through. Yeah, I mean, it's really like um, not to diss myself or anything, but try not to step on her toes. Yeah, and then also, I, I think when you're working with, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. When you're working with someone like her, it's like knowing the right time to address a technical yeah. issue. Yeah. So, you know, if she's still like working on the lyrics of a song, you're not going to come in and go like, we need to sort out the bottom end, right, you know? Right. <laughs> so there's actually one song on Volta called Earth Intruders where I, base, I waited for a year for the right moment to, you know, it's like, it's a couple of hours work, but, sure. you know. But it has um, to be done at the right time. Yeah, but it's kind of funny as well, because then it's like sometimes if you sit there and you're not doing much, you go, well, you know, I want I want to be like valuable. I'm still like charging my rate. I want them to get their money's <laughs> worth. So I got to do something, you know. So yeah, good, did, good at making tea. On, on, yeah. bio, yeah. on biophilia, how, yeah. did, how did all this, when you were working on it, did you, did you know at, at that moment in time that they were going to be essentially 10 or 12 iPad apps, one for each song, and there was going to be an iPad version, and there was... Not at all. Was, so you didn't pre-plan for no. that? No. Well, the whole, um, the curve of that project was really, really interesting, because as I think like our second to last gig on tour, on the Volta tour, um, she kind of called a few of us down, like me and Mark Bell and her manager, and she's like, okay, I've had the vision for the next album. It's going to be about patterns in nature, and it's not just going to be an album. And she also said it'll probably take three, maybe three, four years yeah. we'll spend on it. Wow. So it's kind of like, okay. The manager faints. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like, right at the start, when we kind of got down to working on it properly, sh uh, she wanted to actually, like, make a musical house in Iceland, and each room would be a song. And it's funny what you guys are saying about the educational part of this show. Like, was one of, that was one of the key things to her, was she wanted it to have an educational aspect, mm -hmm. So, and especially mm -hmm. for kids to go and, like, be able to explore music in a different way. So originally there's going to be this physical house built somewhere that you could go and visit and, you know. Wow. And then that morphed into, uh, it was going to be an IMAX film for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, again, Michelle Gondry and her friend Sean, uh, who's an Icelandic novelist and poet, they wrote a full script, full treatment for it. Mm -hmm. And by that point, um, well, when she said like the, the project was going to take that amount of time, I, th I kind of figured, well, okay, I'm going to need to do something with my time that'll be useful for it that's not gonna step on her toes. So I decided to learn Max MSP, which is a, a graphical programming language. Actually, Mark Bell, who's one of her long-term collaborators, suggested, oh, we should learn Max MSP because it'd be really useful for this. So that was like a really, really, really long learning curve, but I felt on tour, like the lemurs were amazing, but I felt I hadn't scratched or really gone beneath the surface of what they're capable of. So cut a long story short, um, you know, she would talk a lot about the musical concepts that she wanted to do, and then I'd start messing around with the software, and then I wound up designing a few, like, performance systems that she could use live in the studio. Describe what a performance system is. Well, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's funny, like, we, we're never too sure what to call them, like, but basically it's... Like, what, like a chaos pad or no, well, thing, or is it a... We did some things where what, what we wanted to do was give her a way to get her ideas out without being bogged down by worrying about what buttons and what things do. We wanted oh. stuff to be super intuitive. Um, and we wanted her to be able to control them as a singer. Um, so a, a lot of the limitation of electronic music can be that you're bound into the computer's grid. And if you're a singer, you're a performer playing along, uh, you're kind of always waiting for the computer to get to the next part. Or you know, that could be an existing back and track played by people. So um, 
actually early on, Mark Bell was doing some experiments with like MIDI modifiers in Ableton Live. And then one of the first tutorials in the Max MSP 20 tutorials thing is how to get uh, cra hack into the input of a Logitech game controller. Oh, really? So I wound up like making little patch that would just take all the buttons and send them to MIDI. And, uh, and then we plugged that into his, uh, his like Ableton kind of systems. And then when she'd turn up in the studio, we'd just like give her this game controller and go, here, press that. And it would kind of play chords. And she's like, OK, give me a mic. And one of those you know, sketches is on the album. It's a song called Dark I Matter. I feel so inadequate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. Oh, we haven't got to the good part. Wait till oh, yeah. the, the Apple collaboration comes in. <laughs> oh, my goodness. They actually collaborated with Apple. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Jumping but ahead. So, so yeah, so that, that kind of proved to be a really fruitful thing. Because also, like, one of the things I love about Björk is she never wants to repeat herself. Yeah. So she'd be talking about some things or ways she'd want to treat audio. And you know, in the back of your head, you go, well, we could just like map stuff out on a keyboard and do it that way. But it's kind of, if she's done it, it's not exciting. So I then wound up designing a couple of systems that also use the lemur. And basically, there's this, sorry if this gets a bit geeky, but there's this protocol called OSC, mm -hmm. um, which is like a super fast network communication thing. And you can send messages to the lemur as well as from the lemur to the computer. So. I figured out how to design stuff so she could like draw in melodies and have ways to link them together. Um, and you know, the, the lemur would like flash in Can time. Can the mixed version of that I mean, the, over the weekend? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask you this, the, the, the question that comes to mind is, first of all, you know, kudos to you, that's, that's impressive, but is it musical? I mean, can, can you take all this crap and make a record with it that I want to buy and, and get moved by? That's, uh, well, I guess you'd have to buy the record and tell me if you like I, it or not. I have but, this uh, the record, yeah. and I, I, it's so seamlessly done, I wouldn't have asked the question if I didn't think that, because <laughs> it wouldn't embarrass you, but it's yeah. really very musical. Cool. And when you describe it, you can imagine my thought process being somewhat technical also. Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, this isn't a question, it's a compliment, you know, but how, how you got all this technology to be well musical and, and make a record? It comes, I mean, the, the most amazing thing about working on that was knowing that it was for her, basically, and she's like such an emotional and intuitive person and such an amazing artist that you kind of know she's going to take care of that so side of it. So end. I could like nerd alert as hard as I wanted, you know. <laughs> My little room would be like, whoop, whoop, nerd alert, nerd alert, nerd alert. <laughs> And then, you know, hand it to her to actually turn it into what's, been the, what's, what's been the response with, the, with the, each song being its own app? Well, um, that, is, you know is, what? That came out exactly the same time as my second child, so I almost kind of fell off the earth uh, uh, when that happened. But I think, I think people have really enjoyed it. And, you know, from what I've heard of the, the crew that's toured it, you know, I, I really wish I could have gone to one, but sh she's wound up setting it up so that kids can come in uh, I don't know if you know much about the tour, but they've got like full-on like Tesla machines and these massive like robotic instruments oh, that play stuff. The new tour. Um, and yeah, so she's been doing these kind of workshops where kids can come in and, and like play with all the apps, and then like I believe have the instruments play their so compositions. So this will be, this, this, will, this will generate another record, you think? Uh, I don't know if that'll make another record. I think, I mean. I haven't hung out with her for about a year because I've been sure. happy families in Montreal and she's sure. been off on tour. Well, you've been working but, on the killers. Yeah, right? exactly. Get, I want to talk about the killers. So, um, yeah, but, but I mean, it, it, anyway, actually going back to your earlier question, that after there's a whole IMAX movie thing, we had, um, you know, all these lemur screens going. The iPad was released about like a year, year and a half into the project and she got one of the first ones and we'd been in Puerto Rico for seven months, buried away. We went up to New York and she's like, check this out. And we we're kind of looking at the iPad then looking at the lemurs and going, hang on. Uh, like, yeah. yeah. So then she, I mean, she was in an amazing position where she, she just got in touch with, you know, the people who'd made her favorite app so far and they collaborated with her to make the kind of the, the finished versions and you know I wound up get I got to spend like two months just like bouncing down audio files and trying to give everyone everything they needed oh and God. yeah well, as, as well, such a crazy project well, but this this almost seems an impossible segue but let's go from Bjork to the killers Please man that, the yeah. new record is fantastic I, cool, I, I love cool. your contributions uh, my, my buddy from Atlanta we Kind of, we, I can't say we started at the same studio, but uh -huh. we worked a lot at the same studio, Brendan O'Brien, so shout cool. out to Brendan and the great work he did. But, um, uh, man, I forgot the name of the song I like, Flesh and Bone. Flesh and Bone. Yeah, what a great song. How did you, like, when, it, when you, res did you, you produce that, right? Uh, yeah, me and Steve Lillywhite co-produced that song, and oh, I, I did a Lillywhite. ton of programming on it, so, yeah. But it's, it's interesting, because that was actually 
pretty much the first song we worked on together. Because um, I got a, I got a, I'd met the guys actually on tour when we were in Brazil, mm -hmm. and we got on really well. But then, um, yeah, I got a call, and they're just like, "Can you work on some stuff?" And I was like, "Yeah, that sounds great." And then they're like, "Can we send you something now?" <laughs> pretty much. So Brandon actually sent me up like his first sketch of that song and uh, just said, you know, go to town on it. So I just did a ton of programming and kind of, you know, messed around and then sent them stuff back. But like a, a lot of like all the weird stuff on the intro is kind of things I programmed up. And, you know, with them, they go through like a lot of versions and really explore different aspects of the mm -hmm. song. So, you know, it evolved a lot. And, and Steve did a lot on that one as well. Mm. Um, I like the way it builds. Mm. It, 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 it starts kind of kind of safe and then at some point, it's just got this epic quality, yeah. and, and I, so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, how would I have done this? And, and I, I didn't get an answer in my head. Right. It was like, pretty cool. Did, did, was it conceived and presented to you in an epic way, or, or was that something that, well, that in I conjunction I mean, the, with the Steve? song and the melody and stuff inherently is epic, and I remember actually I was, I was walking with my wife down the street to our daughter's school to go to a meet the teacher, and Brandon had just emailed me, mm -hmm. like, his kind of, it's just like the first verse in the chorus of that, and I was playing it out on my phone walking down the street, and he's, like, such an amazing singer. I just remember, like, hearing it and just, like, looking at my wife and going, yeah, yeah, all right, and <laughs> she was like, uh-huh. My wife's an amazing musician, so oh, it's cool. like she was just like, yeah, that's that's that oh, that's wow. a go right there. So, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of it kind of leads, and and you know, in a very different way, like the Killers and Brandon in particular, like he's just so fierce about knowing what a song should feel like, mm -hmm. and he doesn't give a crap about like any of the technicalities of it. He just like really reacts. I, I felt like his kind of punk rock background came came through more on this record than they did on earlier records. Right, he, right, he, but but. If you remember, if you can't, I understand, but mm -hmm. what what effects you had on that vocal, the, the, I, I, they, they're um, very well done. That one was probably, I would have done a lot. I'm quite into like having a different chain between like verses and choruses, yeah. and I do a ton of automation. Also, too, but. It, was, it, was, it had effects, but the mm -hmm. effects fit the, the epicness of it, if yeah. there is such a word, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, to do that, the, the potential exists to end it sounding like he's singing in a sewer pipe. But yeah. you cut the sewer pipe out. <laughs> exactly. And I know there's an anti sewer pipe plug in somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on the beta. beta <laughs> <laughs> but can you, can you take me through the, through the uh, effects? Um, Cause, cause I, mean, I think I our use... audience should learn those. They're yeah. really great. Um, I mean, if we talk about like insert effects, um, there's, there's this one EQ that everyone has to have, which is called DMG Equality. There's this guy in England who makes it. It's like ninety dollars, or it's it's ridiculous. What's it called? Um, DMG Equality. Hmm. Can I get a free one? Uh, I'll I'll have a order them. <laughs> um, but I kind of I pretty much have that first in my chain on almost everything, and it's a perfect like really precise take out weird problem frequencies kind of oh, kind of okay. a thing. So like I normally have like my corrective stuff first, and then yeah, same here. Yeah, and then like whatever compression stuff, and then some EQs. What did you use for compression? Um, I mean, I mixed all this stuff in the box, um, so just it's kind of like the the virtual versions of the analog classics, <laughs> basically. Ooh, okay. But I, I never really have a one particular one that I always use. Like, I mean, what I love about mixing Are digitally. Are you trying to tell me that you, you're going to do really well in batter's box? Is that what you're trying to tell? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's coming up. That is coming up. Let's let's let's. How's uh, your arm? Is it warm? It's good, but I wanna, I wanna, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm going to beat this vocal out of it. I have right, to go yeah, over there and cool. do it physically. I mean, the honest the honest answer is I really don't remember. Oh yeah. Uh, um, but um, if I guessed, would you know if I was right? I mean, I would have probably had like you know an 1176 and LA2A probably at our compressor on there. Like I, the way I kind of tend to approach mixing in the box is like you do something and then that's just the sound. I don't go like I have one EQ that has to everything has to happen on that. It's yeah, and cool. and yeah. you know when I've been really actually amazed with how far plugins have come, particularly in the last couple of years. Like yeah. there's stuff where you, you insert it. Uh -huh. um, and it has a sound already without even mm -hmm. twiddling anything. So right. really like the, the kind of inherent character that's in a sound, you just like put something on, you go yes, no, yes, no, straight mm -hmm. away. And I've been diving really deep into all the Universal Audio stuff recently as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, but actually here. Garth Richardson, um, I don't know if you know Garth, but he told me this trick about having an LA3A running into an LA2A, both of them on limit. Yeah, and that's both doing like, yeah, yeah, like a couple of dBs of gain yeah. reduction. I mixed an album yeah. at the warehouse in Vancouver, and that was the first time I'd had both of them. Mm. And that kind of blew my mind, so I was like trying to replicate that in the computer. 
But then it's, I mean, it's what, what's great as, as well about digital stuff is it's like you have your things that can do very transparent, corrective mm -hmm. stuff. So like our compressor is great like that. I mean, obviously you can tweak it to be crazy, but if you just mm -hmm. want to like That's round. island compressor, yeah, by the exactly. way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you have stuff where you know like you can whack it on and it'll do something crazy. Like I don't know if you've messed around much with the Helios. I do. Yeah, like I, I'm finding I that. I still haven't figured out how to use the damn thing, but. You know, I, I put it in and didn't get it to start with, and then I found, yeah. like, if you put it in and don't touch any of the booster <laughs> cuts. Seriously, but, like, this sounds really weird, but if you move the middle frequency, it, it I, does something in the phase. Yeah, it's like a, how do you say that word? Nivio, Nivio EQ, the kind of EQ where the bell shapes right. change depending yeah, on the gain. Yeah, it does it, all it this does weird, weird stuff. stuff. But that's, that's great as well, because I think what can happen yeah. is, like, you know, we basically a huge part of our work is very technical. And when you feel you know exactly what everything you're doing does, it gets really boring and of you course. can get a bit dried yeah. out. So it's great to like go, I don't know what that's Just doing, but it sounds good, yeah. you know? Take the lid away. Yeah. Um, but you know, again, coming back to like Brandon's effects, like I'm, I'm all over um, Echo Boy, the sound toys Echo Boy. Mm -hmm. Like I use that on, on everything. I hear some decapitator in there. Uh, it's possible. There's a little spoken word outro actually, which Stuart Price processed because um, oh. he did a remix of it and then they grabbed a couple of sounds from him and we kind of popped that over the top. It was, it was quite a funny like hybrid mix because actually Robert Root who uh, works at the band studio, he's a brilliant engineer and like become a really really dear friend. We wound up, we've got a co-mix credit on it, he did a mix, I did a mix mm. and we liked stuff from both our mixes and it's kind of a bit of a pain in the ass but it worked but we were like well let's grab those bits from Root's oh, mix wow. and shove them in my mix <laughs> and you know. Well, you so. didn't grab them as edits, you grabbed them as Plugins? Like uh, no, we we just like bounce straight bounce the audio oh, and okay. then like fire it in and replace that stuff on mine. So, yeah. Tee it up, buddy. Batter's oh my time. gosh, oh I my can't believe the time has gone by. Because <laughs> he's good. Um, okay, give me plugins, okay? All right, let's do it. Uh, uh, but you're the guest. You can do whatever you want. Thanks, man. But you don't get points. All right. <laughs> Lead vocal. Everything. <laughs> Perfect. And we're done. Yeah. Hi hats. Uh, DSer. Um, oh. Lo-fi, the old school wow. did you design so lo-fi. Into the lair yeah. last week yeah. on, on that. That might have been where, you, where I saw it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very possible. Yeah. Uh, kick drums. Um, the DMG quality on a parallel for filtering down, getting the right subs, 1176s, and uh, sometimes an L1. Oh, cool. So, yeah. Good answer. Damn it. Uh, overhead microphones. On live drums? Um, as little as possible, but quite often, that's another one with the DMG quality because you always have some weird frequencies that just take your head off. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, 1176s again, and I've been getting to the studio tape thing a lot recently as well, the, oh. uh, the universal audio, just for being able to round your top end. The one oh, oh, the studio. The studio, yeah, the 800 yeah. one, yeah. The, uh, rock guitar. Um, I, rock guitar I don't think it's like on the Killers record. Yeah, 1176. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, okay. and Helios again, UAD tape. Uh, kind of, it, it depends if we're talking like doo -doo -doo guitar, like leads yeah. or whatever, you know. That classic Helios sound. I yeah. So many records. Acoustic guitar. Uh, Fairchild. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, last one. Last. One. What's that? Uh, oh, you didn't hear that? No, I didn't hear oh. that. <laughs> Live strings. Uh, Fairchild. Okay. Yeah, Whoa. all the way. How do you do her? They, great. I mean, it's the international version. Am I ever going to win one of these? You've won a few earlier, but, you know, as the guests improve... I, I thought it was a beautiful collaboration. It was kind of like a ballet between the two of us, you know? Yeah, but this is a competition. Yeah. Yeah. He's being nice. He's, He's coming guest. back. <laughs> we might not let him leave. Want to host the show next week? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Matter of fact, as we, as we segue to corner office, I know that you're... Your upbringing, you've traveled a lot in yes. lots of different places, as, as, your, as have your parents. Yeah. Has that, well, one, let folks know how much you've traveled, and has, has that influenced sort of your taste and how you approach music? It's, I think as time goes on, the more I realize how profound the influence has been. It was, mm -hmm. I, I spent my teens in New Zealand, and it was interesting when we were on tour with Bjork, we went and uh, played Big Day Out, which is a festival in Australia and yeah. New Zealand. And when I was 16, the very first Big Day Out happened, like Smashing Pumpkins and Soundgarden were playing, and I'd like, you know, we played the same set as Smashing Pumpkins, so for me to come back and see that was pretty cool. Amazing. But it was interesting to go back and go, okay, well, like, what influence has that place had on me? And basically, it was driving around in my little Toyota, listening to, like, mad records, right. and, like, but driving around, like, crazy mountains, and, right, you right. know, like, by the ocean and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So, and I think there's also a big influence of, you know, this is like early mid 90s when I was really getting into music out there. And, you know, say 
I'd read British Music Press, but it would come over on a boat. Mm -hmm. So you'd get like Melody Maker four months after it was printed, then you'd read about a band and go around all the record shops in town trying to find that record and they didn't have yeah, it. So sure. then it could take another few months to get a record. So yeah. in a way, it kind of gave me this really nice, like idealized version of the music industry. And like, oh, there's this place on the other side it's of the world magic. where people make trippy sounds and they don't care about rugby. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, I used to um, live for NME and, uh, yeah. and Melody Maker. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it was, it's interesting as well, even in New Zealand, like I spent the first 10 years of my life in Canada. And like I remember sitting in the back of my parents' station wagon, like listening to Sledgehammer or something sure. like that. And the feeling of doing that on this massive continent is very different to the feeling of listening to a record in like a little kind of grey island in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, it's true. And uh, you know, then my parents lived in Saudi Arabia for a bit, and I was going out there and like listening to The Cure, you know, or or whatever. Oh, wow. or actually, Nine Inch Nails. I got their first album when I was on a flight over there, and just like you know, so there's. Definitely, like the way that landscape influences what you hear is huge, Absolutely. and that's where again, like working with Bjork was amazing because we'd mostly be set up in like these non-studio locations. So we'd be like by a lake in the middle of nowhere in Iceland, or like by the you know by the water in the Caribbean. And when she worked in New York, she made sure she was somewhere with a view. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely, kind of like intricately linked with yeah the sense of space. And I think what I really love about music and why I do it is like you can put on a record and it will affect your environment, it will affect your subjective experience of the world Very around you. So. so that's probably my, my, my biggest Very hook into so. it. When you're making a record do you feel that you're that you're putting that quality into the record yourself or you just pray it happens? Well you just try and make it good don't you? I yeah. mean you know yeah. um, I think if, you, if you're too much of a clever bastard <laughs> you can fall on your face but I mean, you can probably stand back and think that. I mean, I, I have like a kind of left my own device since my preferences kind of lean towards like banging beats, but then like a real sense of space and kind of atmosphere. Mm. So, you know, if I'm if I'm mixing a track that has that kind of an element in it, then I'll, I'll really try and bring it out. And actually, there's there's a couple of bands from Toronto whose album I mix. There's this band Ostra who are on mm -hmm. Domino who are just amazing. And then actually their drummer had this other band, Trust, and like those were just the most fun ever to mix. Mm -hmm. But I, actually, you know, the, it's really interesting. I just have to like go on about Canada for a sure. second. Because for, for after like 10 years living in London and like I was really involved in a lot of electronic stuff and like some of my heroes I worked with there, like Uncle and the Prodigy in particular. Tom Don't work with I Tom. Yeah, yeah, he was he was such a great influence. Um, hey, me too. And I just, just saw him by Skype. Yeah, he's he just like, influence. no bullshit and get on with it, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, to then, like, the, the public in England is super, super switched on with, yes. like, you know, the whole, like, evolution of rave and techno and all, all this electronic yeah. music. Then you go to Canada where that isn't really in the, in the mainstream. And those two bands in particular, it was really interesting because they kind of developed this huge musical talent. Like, Maya, who's a drummer and Trust and Programmed and Trust and Oster, like, she did, like, full-on orchestral percussion and she played in taiko ensembles and Katie, who's their singer, is, like, a yeah. full-on classically trained can score an opera kind of person. And then, you know, the year before I worked with them, they discovered Chicago House. You know, oh, so yeah. then it's like, and they got computers and they started programming stuff with um, just unencumbered by, like, what Jeff Mills did. 20 years ago sure. or something, you know, which mm -hmm. any time I fire up a synthesizer, I kind of like have one, one eye over my mm -hmm. shoulder, like, is it going to be as good as a bomb squad? Oh, no, I don't know. I had to remix, a, my, 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 my second thing I ever did out here, I had to remix, thought it was me by the bomb oh, squad. Really? And I, I, I asked uh, Hank and Keith Shockley for permission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So let, let's, let's introduce G.I. Griffin over in our corner office. G.I., yeah. how are you? Pretty good. Uh, cubicles, uh, it's getting a little small, but we're getting there. Oh, okay. Is that your way of saying you want a bigger office? I think. Well, yeah, I, I, I wasn't gonna come out and say it, but you know, does it have to be the main up. office now. We have to change the segment. <laughs> GI, shoot us a couple of questions, please. All right. First one is from uh, Avi Lettinger. Damien, did you use additional distortion uh, or saturation units when you mixed some of the Prodigy tunes, or is it the source Ooh. material that got That's this distorted great. sound? Cool. Um, well, I'm glad we get to talk about the Prodigy finally, but like Liam Hallett is... Always outnumbered. Oof. Yeah, he is a master of distortion, um, and that's all him, basically. Um, he's like... I could probably spend about six hours saying good things about Liam, but he, he's just got such a clear ear about what he wants stuff to sound like, or, or, or not really... He, he doesn't really walk in and go, it's going to sound like this and make it happen, but he knows what the aesthetic is that he's going for. Yeah. And he's one of the most interesting people I've worked with in that he has no hesitation to throw stuff away. Like on Always Outnumbered, like him and Neil McClellan and I, we, we worked on like a, a bass drum and a bass for like five days on one song, just trying to get it exactly right and it wasn't so we binned it. 
Um, and you know, there's songs that would go through like five versions. He'd just come in the next day and go, no, 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 I've just, I've, I've turned it on and said, I've just got a completely different version, plug in his laptop and it'd be amazing. He'd just like, this is the best thing I've ever heard, comes in the next day, no, 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 get rid of that. This is how it goes. And, um, but yeah, he's, he's huge into distortion and it, it, he's, it's almost like, you know what I was saying before about Bjork, it's like leaving the space, that, like with him, it's, you know that he knows how to make a record sound like a Prodigy record, not me, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, uh, and, and it's like if I can help him or, or facilitate that or whatever, just like, you know, like the, the second record that I worked on with him, which was uh, Invaders Must Die, I actually came straight off the Bjork tour and went into that with him and it was just the most fun ever. But it was great because he'd, he'd give me like multi-tracks and say, you know, I'm just thinking this and this, what do you think about the structure? He just wanted a fresh opinion because he'd been working on it for two years. And it was so clear to know like, well, it could use something like this, but you can do it way better than me. So I'd like give him a folder of samples or whatever and go like, I think, why don't we try something like that? And he'd, you know, give it a shot or whatever. Um, but yeah, to answer the question, mm -hmm. Liam. And, and also actually the other thing I have to say is I've, I've only mixed one Prodigy song myself. Neil McClellan mixed all the other stuff that I worked gotcha. on. Um, and again, Liam gives you stuff that is so close to done. It's not even funny. Mm. Um, GI, fire up another one. Next one is from uh, John Leone. When you're working with younger people, what do you find to be a common misconception in their view of the music industry and their work ethic? Hmm, um, well, at, in terms of younger people I'm working with at the moment, I'm really enjoying it because they're much more like, oh great, we can come in and work on something and make it sound good and they've got like so much energy. So it's been brilliant. I think for unsigned artists, the biggest misconception that I've seen is we'll just make this one track and it'll sound awesome, then I'll have a career if you know what I mean. It's just like thinking that there's like one quick fix and then mm -hmm. off you go. That's then right. someone comes and whisks you away, yeah, you know. Yeah, doesn't work that um, way. And Not actually, today's world. Yeah, there's this other artist from Toronto that I worked with recently, I produced his album called Diamond Rings. Yeah. And I think he's like such a brilliant example of how to do things in this day and age, because like he just John made, Regan. John O'Regan, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, right, just right. he like him and his kind of team of people around him, like his friends basically, he yeah. had these songs and they just dressed them up the best they could with what they had but just like created this momentum and energy through just like he, you know, he just recorded his first album super cheap on GarageBand at home, like really naively. And then they'd made all these, like the sequence of really kind of cheeky YouTube videos. But it was enough, it was kind of, it felt alive and you felt like you could feel him evolving and going somewhere. And that's what made me like get in touch with him and go like, hey man, let's do something in the future. Like, I think I can hear how I can kind of take that to the next level. But definitely people I think will pick up on a feeling of momentum in what you're doing. And that goes for like, you know, our side of it in the studio as well as bands or artists or whatever, so. Two more, G.I., give us some. All right, this one is from Andrew Capra. He wants to know a little bit more about the production process for The Killers' uh, new record as far as, as, far as uh, developing production ideas with a band. Okay. Well, really, it's kind of, it was such an unusual project to be involved in, because I don't know if you've seen, but there's actually five different producers on the whole album. Right. And um, I think of all of them, I worked on it the longest, and I was the one who, like, got stuff to mastering, if you know what I mean. Uh -huh. But really, I mean, it's, it's essentially like the band were really like the producers or the exec producers, and they'd say, okay, well, let's bring Damien in for this, or let's, you know, get Steven for that, or I we'll see. use that bit from Brandon. They waited pretty long to involve a producer on this record, didn't they? Yeah, Normally you I'm, bring the producer in somewhere after the songs are conceived. They kind of exactly. brought the producers in there at the end and said, make some changes. Well, it was all, it, there was old songs, new songs on there, like there's a song, Runaways, that I think they've had lying around for like four years, but it wasn't the right time to record it yet or the right context. Um, and then there's other songs on there, like Deadlines and Commitments, that, you know, I went in the little B room with Brandon, you'd just be like, oh, I got an idea, and we'd kind of, you know, turn it into something. And actually there's, there's a few more, like, ridiculously good songs that you just didn't have time to write lyrics on, that it's like, yeah. Um, so, but yeah, really the band would just kind of decide what they wanted to do when. And that, it kind of, to start with, it actually did my head in a bit because I'm used to the whole process when you're working on an album of, you kind of get it to like that 70, 80% mark and then suddenly you really have the clear picture of what you're working on and then, you know, if you, the lesson you learn on that song, you apply to this song and that song and it all kind of comes together. Yeah. Whereas it was really them having the big picture. And once I kind of figured out, okay, they'll pull me in when they want me to do something and I kind of stopped worrying so much about how does this affect that. Yeah, exactly, right. yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, it took me a while to just figure sure. out that's what was going on, <laughs> so. I, I got a question for you. Yeah. Is it true that your studio in Montreal has like just the most incredible amount of bass of anywhere on the world? Well, it's, um, <laughs> 
It can do, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically... You like to monitor loud as hell. I like to monitor loud as hell, oh, yeah. It's man. like, if we're going to be in studios all day, we might as well have fun. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, Let it go. I mean, that's, I also work on Oratone Super Quiet to try and counter that. But basically, I wanted to have a room that felt like a kind of a makeshift setup, but I wanted to have the professionalism and the accuracy of working like Strong Room Studio One, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. so, so actually, I worked with this designer called John Brandt, who's based in Indonesia now. I think he's from Nashville originally. Mm. Just found him on the internet. And uh, I built my place in a corner of a warehouse, so we had complete freedom on the dimensions of the brooms. And it's very simply designed, but um, my main kind of mix room or control room if you want to call it but it's like 600 square feet because i wanted everyone to be able to hang out in there at the same time then there's a couple of recording rooms but that's just the modal distribution is even down to 21.6 hertz in there so Ooh, without any EQs or anything? yeah exactly so oh, like i've actually tested impressive. having like massive subwoofers in there and i actually prefer it just with like my focals without them just because it's so much cleaner like without having a crossover in there so, so I've just found I can, I've been able to do things with bass in there that I haven't been able to do anywhere else. And then um, I normally send it to Emily Lazar and Joe Laporta at the lodge and they'll crank even more in for me. So, you know. Oh, tell her I said yeah. Last one, GI. All right, last one is from Iha Fieha. And this is for either Dave or Damien. Some music genres are made to sound dirty uh, like indie. Others are made to sound uh, clear as, as a Photoshop crystal. Any tips on how we can make a song sound pleasantly dirty? Hmm. I got some jokes there, but I'm gonna let it slide. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, what's interesting is just we, drop a few f bombs. Yeah, that's we, all. Yeah. I did. We both looked at you because we knew yeah. this was gonna go right Dude. down your alley. <laughs> it's like, oh lord, here comes something. Do you wanna do you wanna lead the charge on that one? Or? Yeah, you know what? Um, the obvious number one tip is 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 as early as possible integrate that concept into the into the plan for the song. I get I get songs when they're done, and 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 then to add dirt when the mix when the it's already conceived and done without it can be very very tricky. And 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 at that point in time, you'll find an element or something that you want a little a little. I I don't look at it as distortion or dirt. I look at it as color. It's, it's just another color, and. Uh, Distortion, like we've said on early, earlier shows, it's not an elephant man thing. It's a rich collection of harmonics that you can use to enhance uh, whatever you're trying to enhance. So perhaps the thing might be to, to philosophically change some of the, the words and say, how can I add color to a mix? How can I enhance a feeling in this mix through various uses of different colorations? And that, that's, that's, that's a domain where the analog world works extremely well. You've got things like culture vulture, thermionic uh, culture vulture, but we, we mentioned decapitator, it works well. Our, our friends at Isotope have trash, it works well. Uh, we've mentioned on several shows Steve Massey, he's got a THC. Uh, Futz box with Mac DSP is one of my favorite. But think, of, think of adding color to the mix. That's, that's probably going to get you started on the right path. And yeah, I'll just throw in two cents, which is normally when you're distorting, um, try grabbing like DMG equality, for example, there, there'll very often be like one frequency that just goes way out of control. Mm -hmm. And there's like, back in the day, before there was all these beautiful distortion plugins, I basically did a ton of stuff with lo-fi. And if you mess around with how you compress and EQ something before and after the distortion, mm -hmm. you can get very different effects. So even that one just had like saturate and distortion more or less. If you kind of slam the top end into it and pull it out, it's good. But then again, like you're saying, like the kind of arrangement I'm, I'm, of a song is key. A, I'm working on a group called D Mechanic, and, and, uh, and for some reason, I've been drawn to Lo-Fi again. I'm using Lo-Fi lo right. on about a, half of the songs. Yeah, it's an amazing plugin. Here's the uh, important question for us: Did we do Mother Canada proud in this interview? Uh, I think we might be missing one thing, uh -oh. which uh -oh. is oh, uh -oh. oh, oh there we go. God, you've got to be kidding uh, me! Not kidding and at it's all. the Maple Leaf too. There yeah. We go. Oh, I get one too. There you go. Oh, Otherwise, you'll is, start fighting. This so. is incredible, man. Your pancakes <laughs> will never be the same. This is real stuff. Oh, I thought it was Canadian Club. It's sir. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I didn't want to tell you because I was hoping you'd pop it open <laughs> and just start to guzzle. Holy cow. Man, baby. Thank you, man. This, my this touches This touches my heart specifically. Uh, it's, it's been such a pleasure. Man. It's been fun. You, this is you... going right next to my Shadow Hills compressor. <laughs> no question. <laughs> that powerful. No question. This is major. Um, you have to come back. Anytime. Anytime. And yeah. I'll tell you what else would be fun is maybe 
we'll work something out with Will, our producer, yeah. and shoot something from your studio oh, and Skype you in and totally. do some technical stuff. Yeah, and yeah. be really cool in ITL or something. Yeah, Nerd really Alert. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> can we rename ITL Nerd Alert, by Yeah, the way? we can. <laughs> when when we do that. yours, yeah. we'll, do, we'll do Nerd Alert. Lisa, we, let's have a segment for Nerd Alert. Okay. I love it. Then, now, I've, now I've got to go home and think about that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> do, work that do, out. do PC rules apply to Nerd Alert? Can you well, actually say that today? Sure world? we can, absolutely. Oh. You know, we have no rules here, so FCC stands for something else here, which we won't go through. <laughs> Such a pleasure, man. Thank Likewise. you so much. Damon, thanks for the hassle. Say hello to Montreal. And, and Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dave, say goodbye first. Okay. Guys, um, grab the new Killers record. It's, it's, it's really good. And, uh, and, and grab the last couple of Bjork records. Uh, Bjork in particular is, is an artist in the with a capital A, and you, there's so much you can learn from her records. You can, her attitude, uh, just, um, I, I'd love to meet the woman. She's just always been one of my heroes. And, and also, real quickly, just a reminder to have people go to pensadoplace.tv forward slash education, fill out those four quick questions so we can compile this information. Okay. It, it's it's going to be good stuff, okay. don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. All Grab right. those records, guys, and uh, we'll see you next week.